Coming up on One Detroit, it's all about arts and culture. There's some Broadway news for the Detroit Public Theater, plus the future of concerts with Brian McCollum from our partners at the Detroit Free Press. And then from rockabilly to the wah-wah sound, the music of Dennis Coffey. I'm Christy McDonald. Stick around. One Detroit is coming up. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. And viewers like you. Hi there and welcome to One Detroit, I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for joining me. This show is all about arts and culture at a time where we're missing our favorite concerts, plays and events because of COVID-19. Coming up on this One Detroit. You'll hear the story of a play that had its debut here in Detroit. It's called Birthday Candles. It was set to be performed on Broadway this spring, but there is good news about the future of the show. We'll have that coming up. Plus, from rockabilly to jazz, the enduring sound of musician Dennis Coffey. And then, when will we see a concert again? A conversation with writer Brian McCollum from our partners at the Detroit Free Press. It's all coming up. All right, let's start off with the Detroit Public Theater and the news that just came out this month. The production of the play Birthday Candles is back on the schedule. The play, starring Deborah Messing, is set to open fall of 2021 on Broadway. The show was commissioned by the Detroit Public Theater. It had its debut here, and not many plays make it to Broadway, but this one has a unique story. Take a look. Have I wasted my life? You're 17, Goose. In the career of my soul, how many times have I turned from wonder? How many moments of grace have I left unnoticed? How much love have I left unsaid? All right, joining me now, the three producing artistic directors of the Detroit Public Theater, Sarah Winkler, Sarah Claire Corporandi, and Courtney Burkett. Ladies, it's great to see you. It is Thank great. you for having us. It's so good to so, see you. You must be all missing your crew, your theater, your actors. Courtney, what has this, uh, what has this been like so far? I think we miss the, well, we miss the artists a lot, but we really miss the audience. It's really hard to not have the opportunity to um, invite people in and gather and tell these stories and have these profound experiences that people have in the theater. This um, kind of exploration of our shared humanity is what we try to really do. Um, and just to know that we can't do that right now. Um, and we don't know exactly when we're gonna be able to do that again. Uh, we had a really exciting spring plan at Detroit Public Theater. We know that we're gonna come through this and we will be able to invite people back in, but it's hard to be without. Yeah, and Sarah Claire, I think people are just looking for any kind of shared experience online using technology, listening to people read their poetry, um, streaming music. What have you been kind of gravitating towards? I've been reading plays uh, solo, but it's always great to peek in and see what's out there. And I think it's a great opportunity for a lot of artists that don't get a lot of visibility to all have a platform to share their work. And so that's been fun to investigate across the nation and the world, really. Yeah. And Sarah, have, has it been hard to not look ahead and say, oh, gosh, we could do that down the road or start exploring um, and some new things, too? Um, it has been, but at the same time, we've been looking down the road. So um, <clears throat> we have a couple of really exciting ideas um, for when it is safe to gather again um, that, um, that will hopefully take into account a new reality and a changed reality. Um, and um, and we're, we're really looking forward to down the road, um, our play Birthday Candles um, opening on Broadway in the fall. 
and and that really was uh, what the celebration was supposed to be this month of birthday candles you had the world premiere in the spring of 2018 the detroit public theater did and it was supposed to open this month right around this time right on broadway um starring deborah messing um courtney let me start with you talk to us a little bit about birthday candles and um everything that kind of ramped up to what the performance was supposed to be this spring we commissioned Noah Heidel. He is um, a very accomplished playwright who's had multiple plays produced off Broadway and across the country. Uh, he was living in Detroit and he uh, became a fan of Detroit Public Theater early on and joined our board of directors. And so we commissioned him to write a play. Uh, we did a workshop um, and spent a few weeks with the, that great company and really developed the play. And then we did the world premiere at Detroit Public Theater in our third season and Vivian Banesh came in and directed it and it was just a really beautiful production. I wish you so many beautiful hours. Risk your heart. Find your place in the universe. You do that for me. I promise. And with me now is Vivian Benish. She is the director of Birthday Candles. Vivian, it's good to see you. How are you doing in New York? Lovely to see you and, uh, you know, doing okay. Let's talk about the extraordinary journey of, of birthday um, candles and how you first came to direct it at the Detroit Public Theater where it had its, its world premiere. Well, it goes back even before uh, that in terms of my connection. Sarah Claire Corporandi uh, is and was under uh, my time at the Chautauqua Theater Company. I was the artistic director of the Chautauqua Theater Company and she was the managing director there. Um, before going to Detroit. And so she actually came to me and said, Detroit Public Theater wants to commission our first work. Love what they were committing to uh, for a young theater like Detroit Public Theater to commit to a new work like that and to, to seeing it through um, is, is rare. And I was honored to be part of that. that. And so we then started to sort of get to dream about it as a, as a production for Detroit Public Theater. When I talk about the play as, as a poetic souffle, I constantly talk about birthday candles as um, in terms of its buoyancy. You have to get the right consistency for it. it all the recipe me metaphors are so apt in it. It is delicate. It is sweet, but it's got savory in it. It's got comedy. It's got tragedy. Then to be able to take it to Broadway um, and, and the path that you were able to go on um, is not an easy one. And it doesn't happen for every playwright and it doesn't happen for every director. Describe what that experience is, then taking it from the intimacy of the Detroit Public Theater and then bringing it to a larger level. So you're so right. We feel so blessed at every level. E even in this pause right now, um, there's such belief in the project that it will it will out. It will out to its large uh, to its its large debut at uh, at whatever point that happens. Um, but believing in the product so much that that was created. Um, at DPT, we knew, I know Noah and his representation, his agents sort of sent it out broadly and people unsurprisingly were excited, but we know that that's only the tip of the iceberg. Actually getting to production is so rare. And uh, for, there's so many things that have to come together. We had the very smart idea um, when Noah and I were talking, it was actually him, he said, "You're." good friends with Deborah Messing, aren't you? And I was like, yeah, she was my classmate uh, at graduate school at, for acting. And, uh, and I literally went, I can't believe I haven't thought of that. That's brilliant. <laughs> she, is, she is this woman, Ernestine, like, so I called her up and we had lunch. And in the middle of lunch, I was like, I know you get thousands of scripts. I know everyone pitches you. Here comes the pitch. Right? Here comes the pitch. There's this project that I think you just have to read it. Tell me what you think. And, you know, then I expected not to hear from her for many months. But actually, within a week, she texted me and said, oh, my God, what a beautiful play. If they'll have me, 
I'd love to do it. So all of those things sort of fitting together and uh, going in like this, you know, the germ of an idea from an ambitious and gutsy theater company like Detroit Public Theater to uh, Broadway is weird. And I believe this play is going to go on to touch people in every language and become sort of a, a new classic uh, for us. But that its story and its heart started in Detroit and takes place in Michigan is just like a wonderful detail. Lift my gaze towards the infinite? Not so much. Instead, it's like, will I pass my physics test? Do people think I'm funny or do they laugh out of pity? All the time, a quiet voice in my mind whispering, you're not good enough, you're not good enough. You visit Ernestine uh, at many of her birthdays throughout her life. Every single human can find something in this play that relates to their family or themselves or some sort of personal emotional triumph or um, tragedy that they've dealt with. And one of the, the treasures, I think, for us is, was to watch our audience watch the show. Um, even when we went to the Goodman to hear the readings, and there were about 500 people in the audience, and it was the first time they were hearing it, and they their reactions were boisterous and loving. The belief that the three of us had with Noah and the, and the relationship that we had with Noah and with Vivian um, and how we take care of each other and the work to watch that and to the thought that so many more people are going to be able to see that play makes us so joyful. And the thought that that play was born in Detroit is even more special. Can't do this anymore. Stay! <sighs> Stay. Well, I've been here for 11 years. We pack it, so I'm still here, so it's a great room. Back in the day, I worked at Motown Studio A, is about two miles from here, and now I'm working here, and I still go to the museum and play sometimes, so I've traveled two miles in my career. Yeah, I was there every day, so I did Cloud Nine, Just My Imagination, Psychedelic Shack, Someday We'll Be Together, Nitty Gritty with Gladys, it just went on and on. Norman Whitfield came in with an arrangement of a song on Cloud Nine, and I had a wah-wah pedal. He says, that's it. So in two weeks, I was backing up the Temptations in the studio on that record, and then I was there all the time. Check it out. Here. Early on, Dennis Coffey tried collecting the records he played on, like J.J. Barnes, The Shades of Blue, Jamie Coe, The Volumes, a whole lot of Northern Soul, back before his Motown days. Oh, yeah, These things yeah. probably worth a lot of money. Yeah, they are. One time I sold a record for $1,400, and then I stopped selling them. In the 50s, in high school, they called him the rock and roll kid. I started doing blues, and I started doing rockabilly. When I was 14 at McKinsey High School. I had my rockabilly guitar, and I'm doing blue suede shoes and singing it at an assembly, and the kids are going nuts. And I got to tell you, this spinster teacher thought it was too suggestive, and she pulled the plug on my amplifier before I could get done. <laughs> That's the first record I ever played on. I'm Gone by Vic Gallon. If you listen to the Vic Gallon record, you'll hear me, hear me doing a rockabilly solo at the age of 15. Wow, you get paid for playing music. It's pretty cool. We did a session called Crazy Little Satellite about the satellite. And so we actually recorded that record at United Sound and Barry Gordy was the arranger on that session. The record didn't come out in a year, so we were only like still, I don't know, 16 or 17. So I says, well, obviously this record business isn't happening. So I just told him I, I wanted out of my contract and I wasn't interested in the record business anymore. I don't think Barry probably even knows to this day that that's where I first met him. After high school, Coffee joined the Army Airborne in Kentucky. Being airborne is crazy anyways. They give you combat pay for jumping on a plane. 
I get back, still only 20 years old, so now I'm playing six nights a week and making a good living doing music. Back in those days, you could work six nights a week in a club and make a living at it. And then I was a member of the Royal Tones and we were signed to Harry Balk's label. Del Shannon was one of his artists, so, so I played on Handyman with Del Shannon, a Little Town Flirt, all that stuff. Del Shannon told me that the Beatles used to open up for him in England. That little town As the British invaded, Coffee played on, joining recording partner Mike Theodore. They became record producers, all while Coffee worked at Motown as a freelance funk player. Coffee and Theodore produced Rare Earth's first album. See this guy right here? That's me, because their guitar player got lost on the way to the picture, so I put on sunglasses and got in there. They also produced Rodriguez. He's my most memorable artist. The Searching for Sugar Man Rodriguez. And Coffee put out a record of his own. This was the very first one. An LP and a single. This is It's Your Thing, you know, the first instrumental I had out. And it's Coffee and the Lime and Woodard Trio. It didn't sell like the Isley Brothers version. Coffee had to wait a couple of years. It was 1971. This is uh, the Evolution album. Got now for Dennis Coffee, the Detroit guitar band, and Scorpio. I said, well, you know what? What if I write some songs and I'm going to make it like a guitar band? And I'm going to have guitars doing horns and string parts. So, and that whole thing just, just took off, but it took a year before that was a hit. It's been said Scorpio's breakbeat would help lay the foundation for the hip-hop sound. Once Motown left, there were no sessions here anymore. I mean, there was nothing here for, for me to make extra money doing that. I said, you know, maybe this is the time for us to go out to L.A. because I always wanted to do a movie. Black Belt Joe. Black Bell Jones, yeah. It's a karate guy. And, the uh, combo of black exploitation and karate? It movie? was. It certainly was, yeah. Enter Jim Dragon Kelly. I was in L.A. for three years, from 73 to 76, and I got up one day and I said, you know what, I don't even like it out here. It's not fun for me. I'm a Detroit guy. Detroit is just, it's my vibe. Back in the midst of a recession, Coffee had a tough decision to make. I went to work on the assembly line at General Motors. Someone realized who the new hire was. Worried the guitarist's hands could be ruined, he moved Coffee to a less dangerous job. Coffee went to college, became an expert on the lean manufacturing process, and he trained the people running the assembly lines. I made a good living at it. Coffee kept playing and recording, too. Can you get the other stuff, Dave? All right. Dennis can play anything. He is just amazing. So we've been down to hear him at Northern Lights and you know there isn't anything he can't do. And when he came out with this kind of a new genre that fits into our schedule, we thought it'd be great to have him. Coffee's put together a combo for the Greater Detroit Jazz Society at the Shields Restaurant in Southfield. Jerry McKenzie played with Stan Kenton, Ray Teeny with Paul Anka. That's Dave Tatro on trumpet, Scott Gonell at the keyboard. We're playing more contemporary jazz, not the far out avant-garde type jazz. It's just straight ahead American songbook that we're doing in there. To be able to play with the master, I get to check that off my bucket list and you know, and hopefully do some more of these gigs because it's thrilling to play with a, a legend. For a six string instrument, I'm still a student of the instrument. For six strings, there's a lot of possibilities left yet, you know, on the guitar. As we're all adjusting to life in quarantine and social distancing, we still really have no idea when live performances will be coming back. So with this show, we are taking on more arts and culture stories to give you the performances that you're missing and give you an idea of how you can help out some of the cultural organizations that are across our area. 
we're also partnering up with the Detroit Free Press to give you even more coverage. And I caught up recently with music writer and columnist Brian McCollum for the changing arts and culture scene in Detroit moving forward. I think at the end of the day, it's safe to say that nothing replaces the experience of a live communal gathering with lots of people and the, the emotion of the moment of, of a real live concert. Yeah, you know, and you wonder, will we ever be in those spaces again? And, and what, will that, what will that look like? So you were talking about what was the last big concert in Detroit? Not just one of the last big concerts in Detroit, but possibly the last major stadium show in the United States. Yeah, there you go, Garth Brooks. Before, before the world turned upside down. Um, and I'll show you something as well that might send a little shiver up your spine. This was the scene inside that stadium that night. At Warfield. Amazing, amazing. It's, it's going to be a long time before we see that sort of uh, scenario again. Is this like the disruption that is going to have to spawn something totally different in the music industry? We're starting to see uh, some promoters in Europe are experimenting with drive-in concerts, literally people in their vehicles pulling up a la the old uh, outdoor uh, movie cinemas. Uh, there's one thing that's been missing with these online events, they, they've mostly been solo performances just by virtue of the social distancing. So you're not seeing a lot of bands and whatnot. Yeah, you'll probably see some innovative stuff like maybe an outdoor show where there's a performer up on a stage and X number of people can spread out blankets this far apart in a park. Um, in fact, I would bet stuff outdoors will be the first thing we might see coming back on the scene. So you um, are working on a story on an event for the, the city of Detroit is putting on a virtual virtual event. Yeah, there's uh, it's been coming together for quite a while now, actually. And this is uh, through the mayor's office, actually, uh, who's been spearheading this in, in partnership with some of the uh, other arts institutions and foundations in town. They're calling it uh, Everybody Versus COVID, which is inspired by the Detroit Versus Everybody that'll feature 40-something uh, artists, performers, celebrities doing a mix of performances and PSAs. And Detroit Public Television and uh, the Detroit Free Press are kind of teaming up now to, to, to pool our resources to cover arts and culture really and, and expand it because I think so many people are, are hungering for um, a lot of the things that, that brought them joy in, in the arts and, and be able to gather with people. You know, a lot of times the best art is forged out of uh, turbulent times and difficult personal circumstances and all the rest of it. And, and certainly nowhere less than in Detroit over the decades even, you know, the, the volume of great world changing music that's come out of this place is, you know, never ceases to amaze. And I think a lot of it has to do with Detroit's uniquely gritty environment and all, all the rest of that stuff. And, and sure, I think it, we are undoubtedly gonna see some great art emerge out of this time. And, you know, and once, uh, once we have a chance to look back on it all and take stock, um, there's nothing great about what's going on right now, but uh, the fruits of it will be interesting to see. That'll do it for One Detroit. Thanks so much for joining us. Make sure you check us out online at OneDetroitPBS.org for all of the arts and culture stories and the performances we have for you there, plus our daily interviews and updates. Have a great week. I'll see you next time. Take care.
You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. And viewers like you.